Hello and welcome to my workshop. My name is Paul. I'm a luthier and bow maker based in Tasmania, Australia. In this series, I will share some of the projects I work on each week, giving you a glimpse over my shoulder as I work as though you were looking through the window into my workshop. So just looking at uh, how we're lining up with this, how the curve is lining up with this, this line from our French Eugene Sartre is the curve, or the curve is off, so you can see we're matching up quite well to around about this point here and then the stick starts to come away from that curve as we go down. As we look up the other way, it matches it right up until the end point here. It just starts to, to drift away, so we'll need to that'll be slightly cut into it. Um, and getting obviously getting a curve right at the end of the bow like that is just quite difficult. And we'll just have a look at the head end here. Match it reasonably well till we get down here, and then we need to so we need to work on a section here. And then if we look through the middle section, so we need to, to get a curve, bit more curvature in here. And the middle section. itself doesn't line up too badly to about here so we'll work on a section up here and a section uh, down here and that should bring the two ends up but uh, otherwise that's coming along reasonably well And is it present to uh, looking nice and straight? So I'll keep working on that and uh, we'll probably come back to you with the finished result in uh, a few weeks' time. But we'll do a little bit every now and again and uh, we'll get, uh, get a curve, curve in that stick. So I had this week come in a old violin in a lovely old wooden coffin case. And I thought it would be a good opportunity to have a chat about both the violin and the case. They're both uh, some interesting points to be made about them. You often see these wooden coffin cases hidden away in people's attics um, <clears throat> or, you know, grandfather's sheds. And there's various different qualities of case, I suppose, as there's various different qualities of case today. There were various different qualities of case uh, back, in, back uh, in, the, in the day as well. They uh, often date from anywhere, I suppose, from around 1880 through to 1920, 1930s, possibly even sort of, I'm not sure how, how close to pre-war they continued with them before they moved to a more plywood or, or even pressed card type construction. However, you know, many of them you see uh, around the 1900 to 1920 range, which is where I think this one would, would fit in. Often they're painted a, a, a nasty black, they're like black sort of boot polish paint uh, on them. They're constructed of a fairly rough uh, timber and the inside is often just lined with paper. There's not a lot of cushioning or, or support for the instrument on the inside and they tend to be the cheaper ones. And then you see various uh, different qualities of cases 
from uh, ones like this, which have a at least a nice shape on the on the on the lid. Uh, the cheapest two of, of them are, are a straight uh, peaked roof with flat top. This one has flat sides. You see some that will will have a, a more traditional violin case sort of shape, where it'll be shaped in into the body slightly, even on the outside in a, in a timber construction. They're the nicest uh, that you'll see. Um, this one here, though, is the the timber's been left. It's been been made of a, a nice timber, and it's been left with a clear lacquer on it. It's got some nice brass fittings, um, and it actually has a lock. Again, the cheaper ones will just have a flick. Uh, latch on them under a couple of flickable latches that often don't lock this one's also had a nice brass handle in the let into the top uh, which tends to suggest it's a, a nicer case we'll open it up and there's still remnants of a nice uh, wine velo uh, velvet lining on the inside there's it's had a a, a braided edge put in around it as well which is a nice fitting there is some shaping around the instrument to provide a little more support you don't always see that in these old cases there's some nice nice patterned uh, top area it would have originally been a, a lid over this which would have been also lined in this uh, wine colored velvet um, they still don't provide great protection for the instrument. There's potential for these bow spinners when the lid is shut uh, to come in contact with the, the top of the instrument. Uh, and you can see, see damage to the instrument in that in, from, from, from those bow spinners. So it's not a great idea to transport uh, or use these cases for, for general use anymore. This one has some old string packets in it. There's an old... Uh, metal case from Tom's strings and this lovely old faux leather um, case string case which has some writing the cliff or patent and a space for the EA D and the G string. So that's a lovely old case and again this dates back to around the 1920s. There's also one of the string packets is actually dated as 1923 which helps us sort of arrive on a date or around when uh, the, case, the case would obviously have been purchased a little earlier than that and may go right back to the turn of the 20th century. So I think that's about done with the case. We'll take the violin out and have a closer look at it. So now we'll have a look at the uh, violin. I'll show you a close-up of the inside here to start uh, in a moment. It's labelled JB Vion, Le Croix de Petit Champs of Paris. A in 18 to blank so it's labeled as a jb vion circa 1820 jb vion stands for jean baptiste vion he was born in miracourt in france in 1798 and worked under his father until he was 19 and then uh, moved uh, to a, a location closer to Paris and started working uh, with an uh, organ maker um, under the name of Lot and Vion until roughly 1829, I believe. And then he branched out on his own uh, and, and made his own workshops, set up his own workshops from there. We'll completely ignore the label for the moment and I'll go through why I, I would do that. Um, to start off, just looking at the, at the fiddle, at the violin, it's a lovely close grain uh, spruce top. The F holes are very much in the style of Vion's Guarneri 
uh, modelled instruments. Um, they're also very French and slightly um, gothic in their sharpness of the, of the, of the peaks, the, the, the length of this, of this wing. Um, on, on both of the, of the F holes, it's, it's very, very distinctively French. The scroll is a lovely, uh, a lovely example. It's nice and tight. The lines are nice and sharp. The, the eye, the curl of the eye curls right around quite nicely. And it's a lovely, elegant, elegant lines, quite sort of long and thin. The scalloping at the back is, is very nicely done. The neck itself is quite quite thin and it gives it a, a long thin um, feel. There's a lot of finger wear up around this area um, where, where the hand has sat and played a lot of playing in first position. Um, there's also a reasonable amount of wear um, around the back heel of the instrument here and also up in up, in, up on the shoulders. Sometimes this is faked, however, I think if it was faked on this, then it's also been worn just by, just by playing. Um, so the instrument's obviously had a lot of playing, um, which is a, is a fantastic thing. It's good, it's lovely to see those old, old instruments that have been well loved and played. There's no significant damage apart from there's been a crack through the, the button at, at some point. Um, what else can I see? There's a fair bit of residual dirt over the instrument, which we'll want to clean off at some point. Often you'll see with French instruments have quite long and uh, pointed uh, corners on the sea belts. This one doesn't have it so much, it's more in the, uh, the, the sort of follows the Viones Guarneri copy, but you see it coming through in the back corners more so here than the, than the top corners. This one possibly, so there's damage to these all four, all these three corners. This one here is, is more of the French lines, uh, and these that, that shows potentially that these ones have been would have been more like that had they not been worn and damaged. You also see a deeper uh, edge to your, your perfling channel and it, it sort of flicks up and then rolls over really elegantly. It's a, it's a very French um, sort of styling. The, it's a lovely tight grained, close flamed, nicely, nicely matched flame in the back. Uh, down the back join you can see the flames uh, match slightly off, off kilter which is done on purpose to help the join um, the, the glue in the join take better and the, and the join is a, is, a, is a better more long lasting join when that's done rather than having the flames matching up to go straight across it's a, it's a lovely it's a, it's a lovely example it's a beautiful back and the instrument has overall has a, has a lovely feel to it I'm not an expert when it comes to authenticating old instruments um, however I do have some more than 10 years experience handling old violins that come through uh, both my workshop here and in my previous previous places of employment um, and the, the previous workshops that I've worked in and you, you get a good feel for old instruments and, and their, their, their provenance I suppose you'd say. Um, you also get the opportunity to listen to a lot of other people that have uh, a, a lot of knowledge and you pick up what you can from them as well. Um, so my thoughts would be this is a lovely old French fiddle. Um, I would put it somewhere between around 1850 to 1870, um, partly due to the shape of the neck. It's very much a modern shaped neck. Uh, go back closer to 1800, 1820, you would be more of a classical neck. Um, and pre, uh, sort of 1780, 1770, the neck shape changes again. So there's no signs of this neck having been replaced. There's no signs of a, of a graft or where the head gets scrolled, gets grafted onto the neck. So that would uh, tend to suggest to me that it's been made 
uh, later than sort of 1820, closer to 1850, 1870, 1880, somewhere in that, in that time period. Looks a lovely old French violin. It will clean up very nicely and uh, be a very nice playing instrument for someone. See if I can get a shot of the. You look at the label on the inside. See JBVN. So to get to a few of the reasons I would think that it's not a JBVO. A couple of things, we'll start off with that label. So generally from my information, when uh, JBVO was making his early instruments, they were labelled as a Jean Baptiste Viome of Paris, um, with his full name, and he had a BV uh, anagram, which was double circled on it. Um, it also is uh, been recorded that all his instruments were numbered and that number, that he kept a record of every instrument made by himself or by his workmen. There were, he made roughly 3,000 instruments uh, was made by himself or his workmen. And there's, he's penciled his initials into the, on the inside of the back near the right hand upper corner. There are also numerous trade instruments that did not come from his workshop but have been manufactured since by Miracle firms. Um, so the label on this instrument doesn't match up with any of the labels that he was uh, using himself. Um, and the majority, and in his later instruments, he included the numbering of the what number instrument it was in the label as well. When he was working on his early ones, he also included the name of the organ maker that he was working with in, in his workshops he was working with as well. So they were JBV ohm, what number instrument, then Chez N A Letty, Rue Pave Sensoire, number twenty uh, so the number of the instrument are Paris and then eighteen twenty three or the so if it was an early instrument that's that's more likely how it would be labelled. So the, the, the fact that the labelling doesn't line up tends to suggest it's most more than likely a, a trade instrument made in, in Miracle um, and uh, still to a very high standard and a, and a, and a, lovely, old, a lovely old instrument. Uh, there's also no signs of any uh, uh, other pencil, pencil marks or, or labelling on the inside and I can't see any signs of the, the top being removed and those those marks being removed at any point. The inside presents very nicely. The linings are beautifully led into the corner blocks. Um, there are corner blocks in all four corners and the, the, the workmanship on the inside around the base bar and, and the instrument is, is very lovely. The base bar is a bar that runs up the base side of the instrument and supports the, the base bridge foot. So as Viome's reputation grew, so did the people who copied his instruments. He became very famous for a number of his copies of uh, both a Guarneri uh, violin that was played by Paganini and uh, also a very famous uh, violin by Antonio Stradivari. And uh, he came to make a number of patterns on uh, a number of violins on those along those patterns. I believe this to be a copy of one of his Guarneri uh, instruments or Guarneri-based instruments. 
and it's been labelled as a VM to, to help in its its to aid in, in the manufacturer's ability to sell the instrument. Um, so I hope that wasn't too much rambling on um, about it, and hopefully I can perhaps edit it so it's a, a little more uh, concise. Um, so where to from here for the for the instrument? I'll be cleaning it, fitting a new bridge, sound post, new pegs. We'll be trimming up the fingerboard, putting a new set of strings on it. We'll do a little repair work to the to the tailpiece, uh, and we'll also go through. There's a few seams that are uh, undone. I won't be doing a full, as you would say, restoration on the instrument where we we, we will be maintaining a lot of the patina and wear um, while uh, doing more of a preservation on the instrument rather than restoration, maintaining uh, the, the patina and the, and the areas of wear from previous playing. Um, it's all part of the story of the instrument and is not going to damage cause in any damage to the instrument to leave it leaving it like that. So uh, if you wish to follow on with uh, the progress of this instrument as I uh, repair it and restore it over the coming weeks, uh, hit like and subscribe and uh, you'll see this one feature in possibly a couple of videos uh, in the upcoming weeks.